right, uh, welcome back. And uh, today we get to talk about pathogen and plant diseases, which is kind of ironic to what we are dealing with uh, in society right now. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I want you to know is that uh, plant diseases and plant pathology and all of that is the same with plants and it's for people. So throughout the many years that I've been working with plants, I have dealt with many epidemics on plants. We have dealt with uh, insects that devastate plants and we have dealt with diseases that are devastating plants and all of those are important because they can be detrimental to our economy as it is right now uh, with our own disease and uh, because California is an agriculture state so all of the whatever disease may happen to be here may affect uh, our agriculture. The same thing is happening except that now it is a virus, a disease that is afflicting humans, and we call it COVID-19. Uh, right now with plants, we are dealing with uh, the citrus greening, was, was, which was also introduced from uh, China. Uh, it's affecting citrus, uh, oranges, and lemons, and lime, and all of those. Uh, and it's distorting the fruit. It's not detrimental, but in the case of, of uh, agriculture, it could be definitely be a problem. But now let's look at diseases on plants. So we're going to be covering uh, some of them, such as powdery mildew, very common uh, to see it out there. Uh, we're going to have uh, certain blights, uh, very rapid death on plants that are going to be out there. Uh, we're going to have some diseases that are going to cause some kind of leaf spot. Uh, we're going to have a twig blight or shoot blight, uh, so rapid death. We're going to see some cankers, dead areas within plants that are going to be uh, area, uh, places where the pathogen may be sleeping or over winter and then infects later on. Uh, we're going to see some diseases that happen to affect the vascular system of the plant, causing what is known as wilt. Uh, and then we're going to see some things that are called galls, which can be uh, equate to tumors uh, for humans, but in plants are not detrimental. So some kind of galls uh, growth on a plant. And then uh, we're going to see some kind of uh, root uh, or there could be possible some root infections uh, such as Procidium welts or pathogens that are going to be affecting uh, the roots. So just like humans, uh, every single part of the plant can be affected by a disease at some point or another. Uh, we've already talked about nematodes or been uh, shown nematodes before. So nematodes are considered a pathogenic organism. So most of the, uh, in agriculture, they are considered a pathogenic, uh, even though it is caused by a worm. Uh, so just be aware of that and I've shown some of these photographs uh, to you before about the nematodes. Uh, but when we are going to be looking at the uh, infection of a disease, there are three very important components uh, that are necessary. Uh, and so this is for human diseases and plant diseases as well. Uh, so this is referred to as the disease triangle and the three components must be present in order for the disease uh, to develop. Uh, so the first thing is that we are going to need a susceptible host. Now one of the things that I want to point out right now is that plant diseases do not really jump to people because we are not a host for plant diseases. We have our own diseases. Uh, and likewise, human or animal diseases do not jump out to plants because they're too far apart. Uh, however, when organisms are closely related, as in mammals, uh, there is the possibility of some of the diseases being shared. And that is where we're dealing with a virus that would normally be found on a bat that happened to find a human as a host, and all of a sudden it became a really bad thing. And so the host has to be susceptible. And if it's not susceptible, then nothing is going to happen. It is also during this uh, 
entire part of the triangle where people can actually do something to stop the disease or uh, slow it down. And that is going to be through the use of resistant varieties. So you may have heard or you may hear plants that are resistant to a specific disease. So people keep selecting, breeding, hybridizing individuals to make them resistant to a disease. There is no such thing as immunity. Uh, we can just uh, put that stronger individual out there that will survive for more ye many years until eventually he may succumb and then by that time we have something new. So here we have a susceptible host. We have a disease known as fire blight uh, that is going to be out there. If you go outside and walk around, you may encounter an evergreen pear. Pears are extremely susceptible to this disease. And so it only affects pears, quinces, raphiolepis, and a few other members of the rose family. And that's it. So only those individuals are susceptible to this disease and it's not gonna affect anything else. Uh, the next thing is the environment. The environment that is either gonna favor the disease where it's then gonna become problematic or it's gonna uh, favor the host where the host immune system may be stronger that is able to defend itself and then uh, slow the disease, uh, the development of the disease. So the environment needs to be favored for one or the other. So this is where we have no control. If we have a lot of rain, that is gonna cause a problem. Uh, it's gonna put the plants under some kind of stress, making them uh, susceptible to the disease. And so this, a lot of rain could potentially could uh, switch the balance to the pathogen and then it's gonna attack the plant. Uh, flooding, we have no control over this. Too cold, we have no control over this. Too hot, we have no control over this. So the environmental factors, we have no control over. We have control over the plant by resistant variety. And the last thing is gonna be the pathogen. The pathogen needs to be here. And so if the pathogen is not here, then the plant can be, uh, live its life uh, for years without having any disease problem. And there's gonna be a lot of plants that were miracle in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And later on, a disease was introduced and it devastated those plants and you can no longer find them around here. So that has happened many, many, many times. So once the pathogen gets introduced, then the pathogen finds the host that is susceptible and depending on the environment, now we have the complete triangle. Now we have a disease, an epidemic or some kind of disease development. So what's very important for you to understand is that 90% of the plant's diseases that you may encounter are gonna be caused by a fungi. So we have plant diseases that are going to be caused by fungi, by bacteria, by viruses, the same thing that are going to be afflicting humans, we're going to have them afflicting plants. So fungi are going to be the majority of the organisms that are going to cause problems on plants. Having said this, like everything we've seen before, there's going to be good fungi that are going to be helpful to plants. Uh, we call those mycorrhiza. Uh, there's going to be bad fungi that are going to be uh, affect, afflicting uh, or causing diseases on plants. There's going to be free living fungi that are just going to be doing their job in rotting organisms and they're not just that are going to be bothering plants. So just be aware of this so that you don't just start blaming organisms calling them bad. Uh, the other thing that is very important for you to understand is that the fungi are going to reproduce to a spore, which is a type of seed. Uh, the seed is gonna land in some kind of nice substrate, uh, the leaf litter, the re, uh, twigs and everything else. And they're gonna germinate uh, like any seeds. And then you're gonna have a mycelium. The mycelium is gonna be the real body of the fungi. Uh, the mycelia is gonna grow through the substrate. They're going to digest uh, the organic matter, and that's what they're gonna consume. At certain point during the season, 
the plant it wants to reproduce. And so you're gonna have the creation of a mushroom. So the mushroom is nothing more than the, uh, an organism for creating spores and dispersing spores, which is gonna be equivalent to a flower and a fruit on a plant. So it's just a minor, minor, minor thing. The real organism is gonna be the mycelium uh, that is gonna be below the ground, usually in some shade or uh, away from drying out. So when you look at some substrate and you see this white filaments, that is the mycelium. Uh, so here it is uh, growing out of a twig that I managed to pull out. So you can see it with your naked eyes if you scrape some, um, some of the organic matter. Uh, they don't like drying out, so they want moisture. Uh, and so that's where you're gonna find them underneath uh, below the substrate where it's gonna be away from the sun and kind of cool and moist. Uh, we have a few other organisms out there that are often blamed uh, for being bad, but they're not. Uh, this is Septoria uh, Frigalo septica, which is uh, the slime mold. So there is such a thing as a slime mold uh, a fungi that a certain, at a certain point in their life is gonna have a slug stage. Uh, the slug stage are just gonna kind of creep out of the substrate. They're gonna congregate and they can move uh, through an area. So sometimes they'll come out of the substrate and move onto a walkway or onto a lawn or some other structure. And so it is not uncommon for people to think that there's some kind of weird monster coming out of the ground. Uh, so it's nothing more than a slime mold. Is it pathogenic? No. Uh, all you gotta do is take a hose and wash it down, it goes away. But if you just let it be over time, it's going to just dry out and this is where it's gonna create its spores. Uh, the common name for this is dog vomit slime mold because apparently when it dries out it looks like the vomit of a dog i don't know uh, but eventually it's just going to create this crust and you can see all of this brownish area that will be the spores that will create new slime molds uh, when they fly out and they land in a nice substrate and they germinate so slime molds not a problem uh, some of them are going to be small and so here we have some slime mold that create uh, some small mushroom-like uh, thing. So this is the spore bearing structure coming out of the substrate. Uh, here's uh, this, a side view of one. And so this one happened to crawl on a leaf. And when people see something like this, they think it's a disease. They send me the pictures and obviously it's just a slime mold. Uh, here's another one that happened to crawl onto this uh, celery or cilantro uh, and it just happened to sporulate or have the spore bearing structures on top of that. Not a problem, just cut the leaf, wash it, it's going to go away. Uh, here's uh, a fungi that is known as witch's butter. Again, completely harmless if you happen to see it, comes out of the substrate uh, and, uh, or you can just wash, uh, wash it away, no problem. Here is uh, the stink horns. And this uh, fortunately have uh, a resemblance to a penis. And it is very common for people to say that there's penis growing out of the ground. It's a stink horn, it's a fungi. It's living off of the substrate, completely harmless. If you don't wanna see it, just break it away, it goes away. Uh, but it's gonna come out in the ground and many people have don't expect it and they get frightened by it and uh, uh, I get phone calls every single year. Or there's gonna be some of the puffballs. Uh, the puffballs are the fruiting structures for the mycorrhiza fungi, which are the good fungi. Uh, and so they're gonna be very common around many trees or other plants. So just let them be. Uh, very nice activities for you to blow on this puffball when it's very dry and let's just let the spores fly out. So puffballs are gonna be not pathogenic. And there's gonna be a few other uh, mushrooms that happen to have some other interest, being uh, our morels here, which is the second best tasting mushroom in the world. So this is very good. If you happen to find it, just make sure that it's the right mushroom. 
uh, before you eat it, but it kind of looks like a brain, but it's very, very good. And uh, we have a few desert mushrooms. So there's gonna be mushrooms in the desert. This one I happen to find here in Long Beach. Uh, this is uh, a desert uh, uh, stock mushroom. So coming out of the ivy, uh, I found a nice uh, population. You can see the spores all over uh, and you can see where it started. And this one I brought out and then I brought it out to take a photograph. Uh, so very uncommon, but if you see them around here, uh, Batteria phalloides, that's uh, the town, hoity toity name for this, Batteria phalloides, uh, desert uh, uh, mushroom. Or there's going to be something like the bird nest fungi, which is once again completely harmless. It just lives out of the substrate, but it's, when people see it, they don't know what it is. It looks weird, it looks like an alien, it looks like sea anemones. Uh, or there's going to be what is known as the fairy ring. Uh, so these are more of a problem with uh, golf courses. So what happens here is that the mushroom and the fungi is feeding off of the dead debris, the grass and everything else that eventually may create a layer that is not going to allow water to go in. And so the grass may suffer because of lack of water. So one of the nice things that you can do here is aerate, punch some holes throughout the ground so that that allows the water to go in and the grass will recover. But it's completely harmless, I guess it's not non-pathogenic, but it's just living there and feeding off of the other organic matter that make us a problem. But the mushroom itself, fungi itself is non-pathogenic. And so we have them growing out in the lawn, uh, as you can see here. Or we have a few other mushrooms that are just gonna be out there living off of the organic matter. There is, however, a fungi that is going to be problematic and these are gonna be the wood rotting fungi. Their job is to rot wood. And they are gonna be one of the few organisms that can digest the lignin and the sugar and wood. Very few organisms can do that. Uh, except for this fungi. And the problem here is that many of the homes are built out of wood. And a beam from a house or a stump, as you see here, is just dead wood waiting for this fungi to consume. So they are going to be a problem for homes and or eventually if it happens to be a tree that is afflicted by disease, it has a lot of dead wood, it can eventually weaken it and cause a tree to fall and fail. But their mushroom or fruiting body is going to be what is known as a conch. And it's going to be more like a half of a disc or a disc that will come out of the stem. So keep in mind that the mycelia, the fungi, is living throughout the entire stem or trunk or wood. And what we're seeing here is just the fruiting body. Uh, here is a different shot and here's uh, the fruiting body and what's also important is that the fruiting body is perennial which means that during certain part of the year when it's active it's going to create a new layer send out the spores the next year it's going to create another layer send out spores and it can keep adding layers to that conch until it becomes a little bit big or bigger uh, underneath uh, the conch is where we have tiny pores, and that is where uh, the spores come out from. Uh, and uh, here's uh, that. And so here's uh, a ash tree that I happened to find. The tree looked good, the stem looks intact, but underneath is telling me something different. Underneath or at the base, we see conks that have been there for a while. They got wet recently, and that's why they kind of moldy. But I can definitely say that this tree it's been rotted, slowly rotting or eating uh, the dead wood. Wood rotting fungi do not really attack the living portion of the tree, unless the tree is severely weakened by something else, some other stress factor, and or is really dying where it cannot really defend itself, then it can be attacked by it. But otherwise, the wood rotting fungi only feed on the center of the tree which is considered the dead wood not the living portion so a tree can be completely hollowed out as long as it has a good living uh, structure 
uh, it can be alive and well for many, 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 many years. Uh, so some of the conchs can be colorful, and you, here you can see an assortment of different conchs at different stages, the newer one here and the old ones uh, towards the bottom. So here's just some different shots. Uh, and uh, uh, in the fall, if you go out there in a walk, you can find uh, the chicken of the forest. Uh, this is a wood rotting fungi, and here you can see it coming out of uh, some kind of wound. So a branch fell here, and so that allowed for the pathogen to colonize. Uh, and uh, it's sporulating, so you can see this beautiful uh, golden sulfur color uh, mushroom coming out of the stem. And uh, some of the other injured areas, you can see where the mushroom is coming out of. So very nice, very beautiful. Uh, again, I don't, probably don't, people don't want to see it, but it's a good thing. Uh, there's the lion's mane uh, fungi. So it just has this uh, filaments. When you touch it, billions of spores are going to come, come out. Uh, and there's a side view of that. And then uh, you have a disease known as anthracnose. Uh, anthracnose is going to be common on sycamores, especially this year when we have some wet uh, season. Uh, so that is lending itself to a good anthracnose season. So most of the fungi that we're going to be covering, most of the diseases are going to require some kind of humidity. So fungi don't like drying out with few exceptions. So when you have humid, wet weather, it's perfect. So anthracnose, it's going to afflict sycamores. Uh, you can kind of see some of the damage here, uh, this white uh, structure, and the leaves is beginning to curl, and the leaves begin to kind of wither away, and then they, they drop off. So is it anthracnose detrimental to the tree? The answer is no. Uh, what happens is that during the summer, the tree may completely defoliate, so it may drop all the leaves, and uh, it'll send a second set of leaves uh, in the summer and then by fall winter it's going to drop them again because of the normal uh, cycle and then it's going to start all over again. So it's just going to be afflicting the leaves to some degree but it's not going to be detrimental at least not in, in the sycamores. Uh, so here is uh, some of the leaves as they've been affected and deformed and distorted so this is the anthracnose fungi and uh, so here's a few more that have already been misshapen and uh, here's a few more. So this is a sycamore. Uh, this one here is in Akuba or Japanese Akuba. Now in Akuba it has a different effect. You're going to have some leaf spots uh, that will become uh, necrotic or dead so they're going to die. Uh, but the disease can walk a little bit more so here's some leaf spot so if it happened to also afflict the stem, it will kill it. And uh, this is going to create that canker that we talked about. So you can see right here the boundary between the living tissue and the dead tissue. And so the next year, this could be the source for the new infections. So it is important that when you see something like this, that you cut all, as many cankers as you can find to minimize. Uh, a severe infection the following year. So if infected or if the stem completely uh, gets girdled by the disease, then the entire stem will die. So depending on the plant, the anthracnose may have certain damage or not, as in the case of the sycamores. Uh, then we have some of the powdery mildew. What is very important for you to understand with powdery mildew is uh, Every single plant in the world has a powdery mildew, uh, but if we don't see it in California, it's because it has not been introduced. Uh, but if you go to the origin of the plants where they were native to, you will find some kind of powdery mildew. Uh, eventually they may get here, uh, but it's just a matter of time. So number one, every plant has a powdery mildew. Number two, powdery mildew is going to be a disease that is going to be host specific. What it means is that the powdery mildew that is affecting roses would only affect roses and or members of the rose family and that's it. So it's not going to affect uh, 
crepe myrtle that has its own uh, powdery mildew or it's not going to affect any other plant other than the roses. The other thing that is important is that powdery mildew is a fungi that is an obligate parasite, which means that it can only feed on a living host, which means that if the plant dies, the powdery mildew will die with it, which means that the powdery mildew does not want to kill the plant. It just wants to feed off of it. It is a parasite. It can cause stress. It can weaken the plant, where then it makes it susceptible for other pathogenic organisms to attack and kill the plant. But powdery mildew is never going to kill its host. It needs a living host. So obligate parasite and host specific, those are two very important words. So the other thing with powdery mildew is that what you're seeing here are the mycelia and the spores and everything outside the leaves. So powdery mildew is completely an external disease. And this is gonna be rare. This is the exception where a powdery mildew fungi loves to have dryness. And so one of the nice things that you can do to avoid any kind of powdery mildew problem is to keep the plants, uh, wash your plants, keep them wet, because that's going to make the environment not suitable for the fungi and it's going to take away the powdery mildew or it's going to lessen the effects of powdery mildew. So here's uh, Palo Verde powdery mildew. Uh, so again, that, it's quite recent introduction, but that's a whole different plant. So it's not going to go to roses. And uh, here's some of a more severe infection on a flower spike on a rose. And here is a flower bud that is going to be affected by it. So can the powdery mildew distort the flower? Yes. Can the flower powdery mildew take away some energy from the flower from a rose, making the flower smaller, maybe not as many? Yes, but it's not going to kill the plant. Uh, plantain with powdery mildew, again, specific to plantains and nothing else. Uh, and then uh, also uh, very similar to powdery mildew, but different is going to be the downy mildews. Downy mildews are also host specific, but they're going to be interior. So they're going to be completely inside. So when you see uh, out here, it's going to be just the spores. Uh, downy mildew, uh, this is on grasses, uh, not really problematic with grasses, but it can affect grapes and um, in grapes because of the grape industry and the wine, it makes it a big problem. Uh, but downy mildews are also host specific and uh, uh, obligate parasites. And uh, here is, uh, I think it's a spinach uh, with the downy mildew coming from the inside. Uh, and here's a different shot of it, uh, the spores. And uh, here's some more uh, downy mildews uh, coming out there and there. Uh, and then we have the other very popular disease known as rust. Uh, just like powdery mildew, the rust is also an obligate parasite because rust is gonna affect certain plants and not all of them. Uh, just like powdery mildew, every single plant has a rust disease. If you don't see it in California, it's because it hasn't made it yet. So host specific, so the rust that affects oxalis can only affect oxalis. The rust that affects snapdragons can only affect rust uh, snapdragons. And this is uh, the rust that affects mallows and hollyhocks and lavateras. So this is the mallow uh, rust. Uh, and just like powdery mildew, the rust are also going to be obligate parasite. So host specific and obligate parasite, which means that rust will not uh, kill your plant. It needs the living host to keep on living. Unlike powdery mildew, rust are completely systemic. They're inside. And so it is only during the time of the year when it's time for them to send out the spores that you will see some of this Cl uh, clusters that will eventually burst and release the copper color spores. So here is roses. And so here you see underneath the leaves, normally uh, because it's nice and humid, uh, you see the rust spores that are right here. 
And so the rust infections love humidity. So it is unfortunate with roses that it has both a powdery mildew and it has a rust infection here in California. So one of the reasons that people recommend that you do not water roses late at night is because that raises the humidity and that makes the environment more conducive to a rust infection. So keeping your plants dry makes it a nice environment for powdery mildew. And keeping the plants wet, which takes away the powdery mildew problem, makes it more conducive to rust infections. So on plants like roses where you have both infections, you have a double problem. But on most other plants that just have a single one, you can manage it better. There is no way to cure it. Knowing that the plants are, have a powdery mildew or a rust uh, and they're whole specific. So knowing that you're growing roses, you know that you're gonna get rust. Knowing that you're growing roses, you know you're gonna get powdery mildew. So you can lessen the effect, slow the disease, by treating the plant before the uh, spores appear because you know they're going to be there. You know the plant's already infected with it. When you see all of the spores already popping out of the leaves, it is already too late. The plant has already gone through its cycle. The spores, uh, fungi has gone through its cycle. It's now sporing it and ready to go to sleep. So do spray or do the treatment before this happens so that you can lessen the effect eventually you will get the rust in the spores and the powdery mildew because as the plant is going to go dormant, the disease is going to be favored by the environment as well. Uh, so that was rust, uh, rust and here is rust anaxales in host specific, its own plant. And uh, very new to us is going to be rust on myrtle or even guava. So this is now affecting uh, myrtles and guavas and any member of the eucalyptus family. So this is, I found like about two years ago at the other campus. So it's already here uh, and uh, we'll see what happens with it. But this is again, only affected members of that family. Uh, and uh, here's uh, uh, an area that was seriously, seriously infected. And there's a few more. And uh, here's one where again, they formed the plant. It's it was in a greenhouse, it was humid, it has a perfect environment. So yeah, this is a severe rust infection right here. And uh, you can see the, all the spores that are just coming out, just distortion and, uh, of the plant right there. So hopefully not, it's not going to get this bad. Uh, and uh, here's uh, more axalis. And actually this is coffee rust. Uh, and then another infection is going to be a called a smut. And uh, smuts are going to be problematic for corn and grasses. And smut is going to be an infection of the flower. So what happens is that with corn, we have a flower. Uh, is that it's, the corn is the flower of the, of the plant. And the hairs that you see on the on the corn or the silk, those are going to be the stigma in style. And so the fungi, smut, corn smut fungi, is going to overwinter in the ground. Uh, and then during the right season, when uh, the stigmas are going to be receptive, the fungi is going to send out the spores in the air and the spores are gonna behave like pollen. So when they land on the tip of this silk, they are then going to infect and the infection is gonna run through the silk down into the kernel or the grain, individual grain. When it infects it, it's gonna distort it. It's gonna create this grotesque uh, growth, uh, which is now gonna be a, just a, a kernel that is gonna be full of spores uh, that will eventually drop to the ground and infect the next year. So this is where there's going to be some grotesqueness on it uh, and uh, uh, distortion and uh, disfiguring of the corn. This is edible. It's a delicacy. Tastes like a mushroom, uh, but it is an infection of 
the flower that starts with the flower and then it goes to the seed. So it can almost be a seedling or a seed infection. So a problem with uh, corn, but more important, uh, it's gonna be a same kind of mud infection or similar that is gonna affect ryegrass that is gonna create ergot and or ergotism. Uh, so research ergot, and uh, that is a source of extreme toxins and annoyingly to people in the old days that they were eating contaminated grains and literally like dragging themselves and uh, kept themselves kind of not in good health because they did not realize that they were eating something that bad. Uh, so corn smut, here it is uh, for sale and people eat it. Uh, and uh, so you can see the individual grains that have been disfigured and grotesque and it, all the black thing that you see here, those are just the spores. And uh, a few other grass uh, flower spikes. So here's uh, a grass, I think this is Bermuda grass and you can see the distorted flowers now just full of uh, spores. Uh, and here you can see the same thing. And uh, here's another one where it's just been completely devoured by this fungi, the seeds and the flower. And here you can see my finger with the spores and you can see the individual grains here or what I've been there. So smuts, they're out there. Keep your eyes open for them. They're kind of cool. And there's the spores on my finger. Uh, there's gonna be certain soil diseases, and these are going to be the Fusarian or Verticillium wilt. Uh, and so you can see in the background here, we have a very healthy plant. And we can see here a plant that is looks wilting and not happy. Uh, and so when we analyze it, uh, here's a different uh, plant that has been uh, infected. Uh, many uh, orchards will take precautions so they'll have some kind of lime or some kind of uh, treatment that you can walk on so make sure that you don't bring the pathogen from a different field. Uh, so don't be surprised if you're going to have to disinfect your feet. Uh, they also use some kind of uh, grafting uh, or resistant variety to uh, fight up the disease. Uh, but even with the grafting, if there is a splash of water from the ground, that happens to jump onto the stem, it could also affect it. So here's what's happening. So you have the graft here, and at some point, the fungus spore jumped or the infection jumped, and it's creating a canker, gradually killing the vascular system and the stem, preventing the water from reaching the top. And that's why it's causing some of those DC uh, wilting uh, symptoms. Uh, so, uh, for here. Uh, so those are soil borne, again, very difficult to control, water management, uh, and that's about it, or using resistant variety or grafting, but those are uh, very problematic. Now, right now, I've gotten several photographs of people sending me this. This is peach leaf curl. Uh, peach leaf curl is not detrimental to peaches, but it's just going to deform the leaves. Uh, it's caused by a fungi. Uh, so here's just different shots of uh, the leaf and different uh, severity of the infection. So it's out there. You might see it. Just be aware of that. Uh, and then there's also going to be gray molds. And gray molds are going to be lesser of an infection and more affecting this very soft tissue. And so here we have a pansy and uh, we have a, some kind of damage, broken leaf uh, that serve as an entry point. And as the fungi grow, uh, grows and uh, devours the plant, you can see the boundary where the healthy tissue is, is versus the one that's been eaten and affected versus the one that has already been killed. So soft tissue, uh, here's a lettuce that was over water, not happy, soft tissue got devoured by uh, this gray mold. And uh, in humid areas where you have a flower such as poinsettia that are grown in high humidity, if there is an infection with uh, uh, the gray mold, then it can affect the flowers. Eventually, if not treated, then it can kill the flowers and the leaves and that is not a sellable product. So it can affect certain uh, sensitive uh, crops like this. 
Uh, and here's the lettuce once again. And this is where I took uh, the magnification through with a microscope uh, to show you the spores, bearing structure, and just the mycelium and everything else on the gray mold. Now, if we move to some of the viruses, uh, plants have their own viruses. Uh, if you ever eat a papaya or if you let it get really old, uh, you may see something like this. This is a papaya ring virus. And it causes this uh, necrotic or dead areas that kind of create a nice circular pattern. And people can eat it. You can eat this papaya, not a problem. It's not gonna affect you. Uh, but almost every papaya that comes into the US has this uh, disease. Uh, so papaya ring virus. Uh, you may also have seen this uh, heavenly bamboo uh, that has the red leaves. The red leaves are caused by a virus. So these are plants that are deliberately uh, infected. So most viruses on plants are not going to be detrimental. There's a few that uh, have occurred in the tropics that devastated industry. So there was viruses that devastated bananas, viruses that devastated and killed coconuts and other tropical plants. But for the most part, uh, viruses on plants are not going to be detrimental. They may cause some kind of problem, some kind of damage, some kind of distortion, some kind of weird color as in the case of our heavily bamboo. Uh, and or with roses, it's going to create uh, this yellowish pattern. Uh, so this is a virus. Uh, so what's important to note here is that the pattern on every single leaflet is gonna be different. So there's no consistency. Uh, and it's gonna be a little bit distorted and uh, not as happy, look sick, because the plant has a virus. So yeah, it has a reason to be uh, sick. Uh, and so here is uh, another leaf from a rose. And you see some leaflets that are smaller, some twisting, not happy, grotesque looking. It's a virus. Uh, there's a few other interesting diseases out there. Uh, this is a dieback on uh, your ficus uh, or figs, uh, Cuban laurel fig. So you may go out into the city and see gigantic trees that die. Uh, Lakewood Boulevard used to have some magnificent individuals and now they're dead, not removed. Uh, but it is uh, a combination of uh, stress from being pruned and a disease from the soil. So it starts like this by decline and eventually an entire tree is gonna be dead. And so that's gonna happen. So it's a dieback on or a decline on a, a Cuban laurel fig uh, that's out there. And or you may see a new disease that is gonna be known as pink rot on Canary Island palms. This is being transmitted through chainsaws. So when a grower or sorry, when somebody prunes uh, an infected palm and they hop to the next one, they are then gonna transmit the spores and infect the palm. And so you see a decline. So here's a happy, healthy palm. And here's one that is almost dead. Uh, and I think it's already gone uh, by the time, but now. Uh, so one of the things that they have mandated is that people disinfect. You dip your chainsaw in bleach solution uh, so that you disinfect it. Or better yet, you can use a handsaw, not a chainsaw, and disinfect your handsaw every single time. Uh, so it's affecting uh, Canary Island palm. And, uh, and next time you see somebody pruning in Canary Island palm, <sighs> brace yourself because if they did not take the right precaution, they could infect it and it's gonna die. And some of them could be quite large. Uh, and then we have a uh, fire blight. Again, I mentioned this one before. This one is uh, affects uh, pears uh, and uh, members of the rose family. So here's a tree. It's called fire blight because there is a rapid death on the stem and uh, it's going to die so quickly that leaves are not going to drop and then you're going to have the flax or the dead branches that are going to linger on. Uh, and we see our life cycle here for fire blight. Uh, we can see that there's a canker where the uh, pathogen overwinters and during the right season, <coughs> which is going to be the beginning of spring, the 
this is caused by a bacteria, first of all. Uh, the bacteria is going to ooze out of those cankers in a golden color honey-like droplets. The droplets are going to attract bees, which they think it's honey. And once the bees begins to walk around and or eat this ooze, they are going to be completely infected with this bacteria. And then naturally, the bees are going to go onto flowers. They're going to collect the pollen and the nectar. And inevitably, uh, uh, the bees are going to put their foot on their nectar, which nectar is a sugary water that is perfect for bacteria to begin to grow. And then uh, that's how the plant's going to be infected. Now, bacteria are not going to force their way into a plant. So most often, it's, if they happen to infect a plant, it's going to be through some kind of cut, uh, pruning cut, or through some kind of natural opening. So in the case of fire blight, once the bee has put their foot on the nectar, then the bacteria is going to begin to reproduce the bacteria will then use or enter the flower through the nectar glands. So those natural openings that are found on the flower that secrete the nectar, and it's going to make its way into the flower, eventually into the flower uh, stem, and it's going to rapidly kill uh, the tiny branch. Or if it happens to go into the main stem, it could kill the main stem and eventually it may kill the entire tree. So this is where every single pair that is out in the city is already affected with it. Uh, and you will see it. So when you, next time you happen to be out and about in the city, just look around at the different types of pairs and you'll see it. So the evergreen pear is the most susceptible uh, the Bradford pear is a little bit more resistant, but you'll still get it. Uh, so here is a bacteria that happens to be uh, a serious problem. And here's the life cycle. Uh, and then we have uh, a big problem with uh, certain plants. This is olives, and olives have been declining for a while. So certain branches that have died, and eventually the entire tree will die. And that uh, happened to be uh, the pathogen named uh, Silella fastidiosa, which causes oleander scorch that is also affecting olives. Uh, so it started with the, uh, oleanders, and uh, it was noticed that every single branch in the plant looks happy except for one single branch in the middle. That is, looks kind of wilty, uh, looks unhappy, and eventually that will die. So when we take a closer look, we can see beautiful uh, leaves and then attached to some of those branches were branches and leaves that were wilting. And so it did not make sense. Uh, and uh, as time went by, uh, entire branches will die. And in a response uh, from the dying branches, you will see shoots coming from the bottom and eventually those will get infected as well. So they could not understand why, uh, because they were trying to find a bacteria and nothing worked. They tried to find uh, viruses and they couldn't find them. Uh, and uh, it just didn't make sense. It wasn't until later when they figured that this was a bacteria, but a bacteria that behaves like a virus. So, and that's why it made it difficult. And they also found the sharpshooter or the glass wing sharpshooter, which is this insect that he, uh, you see here, that became the perfect vector. So prior to the introduction of this uh, insect, there was no problem. Uh, the, the infection of the disease is native to California, but it wasn't affecting all of these other plants until this bigger, uh, stronger insect was introduced from South, uh, I think it was Mexico. So this became the perfect opportunity for the problem. So the vector, the individual organism that transmit the disease is going to be the glass wing sharpshooter. Uh, the infection or the pathogen is going to be the Silella fastidiosa or the uh, scorched uh, bacteria. And so what happens is that this brought a new insight into 
a pathogen that affects the vascular system. So prior to this, they had no idea about vas vascular system or vascular infection. And so this new insect that has a longer mouth was able to probe through some of the bark and drink the sap from an infected plant. Uh, so as it feeds, it's gonna absorb the bacteria when it flies, the bacteria is going to continue to multiply in its mouth. And when the insect visits a healthy plant, it's going to infect it. And it's almost like a mosquito transmitting West Nile virus and a bunch of other diseases on human. But this is in a plant, but it is behaving the same way. And so as the bacteria then gets deposited into the vascular system, it becomes, uh, begins to multiply even more. And so later on, the number of bacteria that grow so huge is going to literally block the vascular system. So this became a vascular infection. And so blocking, clogging the vascular system of the plant prevents the water from reaching the leaves. And that is why you have the same symptoms as a plant that is suffering from water stress. Uh, and so here is a the xylem that would normally be open for water that is now completely blocked. And so this is also known as a fastidious bacteria because it was very difficult to plate it out and figure out what it was. It was a bacteria, but it just requires certain specific uh, media for it to be uh, cultivated. And so it's a fastidious bacteria. It's a, cl a vascular clogging bacteria. It's a big problem. Uh, so here's some of the symptoms uh, of the scorch disease. Uh, so scorch, burning of the leaves, chlorosis, meaning uh, it kind of looks yellowish of color, uh, stunning because it's not going to grow well, and then it declines. Eventually, the entire stem will die, and uh, the plant is going to have some new shoots. Uh, here is uh, some. Uh, of uh, the different strains. So later on, as more research was done, they found that there is not just one uh, strain of the bacteria, there are several of them. Uh, first one was blamed, but later on, nope, there's many of them out there. Uh, and they were causing different problems. And uh, here's a real frightening thing, is that it affects every single plant as long as it gets infected. So there are, it's not specific to anything. And every single year we're finding new plants that are gonna be now infected with this. And so it started with oleander and then it moved to uh, uh, olives and then uh, American sweet gum and then magnolias and a bunch of other things. So here is just a list of, uh, a partial list of plants that have been sampled and found uh, this bacteria inside them. So that was frightening. Uh, now we have uh, some kind of cankers, so dead areas that are going to harbor some of the diseases. And so here we see a nice stem and you can see uh, a disease that is coming out there. So this is a canker. Uh, here you can see where it's just spewing with uh, bacteria and all the pathogen out of it. And uh, here you can see some more. So this is an area that it has died and the bacteria, the fungi, the organism is still living inside. Uh, very common to see it with uh, American sweet gum and you can also smell it. Uh, so next time you're buying American sweet gum, just take a time and smell it. And uh, you can see some kind of bleeding, some kind of oozing. So it's a dead area that is still actively with uh, the pathogen. Or you can see some galls in grotesque tumors on plants, but because plants have an open system, it's not detrimental, unlike humans, we have a closed system. Uh, and so you might see stems that get infected by a bacteria. This is a bacteria that forces the cells to multiply and expand and create these tumors. Again, not detrimental. Uh, you might find them on the ground, afflicting uh, uh, the stem or even the roots, so you can see all these uh, tumors. Uh, or you might find them on the leaves. Now, when you find them on the leaves, they are not caused by a bacteria so much, but by insects. So there are going to be certain insects, certain wasps, 
that have a relationship with the plant where the wasp is going to land on the leaf, they're going to lay the eggs inside the leaves and they're going to spray or add a hormone that will cause the cells in the surrounding area to multiply and expand like a uh, tumor or like a, a wart. Uh, it is within this uh, tissue that the baby wasps that were laid are going to feed on. Uh, and so the baby wasp will be happily inside eating and feeding, growing. And then as they get older, they will then find a way out or chew a way out. So here's some beautiful, colorful galls on some of the other plants. And here's some more uh, right here. And there's some more galls. And so here's a, a nice gall for the top side. And here's uh, one that where there is a hole now. So that organism, insect, happen to Jen uh, now be out and it's an adult. Uh, and uh, here's uh, the hole where it chew its way or its uh, way to, out of freedom. And then uh, we have aloe gall and this is not caused by a pathogen, it's caused by a mite. Uh, so this is a quiver tree uh, or a aloe and you can see all of this uh, grotesque growth. And right now if you go to almost any aloe out there, uh, you're probably going to see it. Uh, so it's just the constant feeding on the mites that distorts the stems and causes uh, some of this grotesque growth uh, on uh, the plant. Uh, you see it right there. Or I'm going to caution you with uh, certain things that may look like a pathogen, but they're not. So here's rosemary and uh, we have a tiny piece or a new shoot that is mutated where it's not able to cause or create uh, chlorophyll. And so it's going to appear as white because that's the color of plants. Uh, well, actually, they color green when they have chlorophyll, but if they're not able to produce chlorophyll, then they're going to be whitish or yellowish. And so this is just a mutation. Uh, it happens to people as well when there is uh, unable to produce some of the pigment and you see some spots that are darker, darker or lighter in color. So just cut this branch. It's fine. Nothing's going to happen. And some of them are going to be selected for being variegated. So here I visited a home of a person who loves variegated plants. Uh, so here's an agave that ideally should be greener, but it's a selection that has lighter color. You can, unable to produce uh, uh, chlorophyll. So just be careful to not confuse a disease for a natural uh, selection of a plant or some kind of mutation or something else. Uh, here's uh, even our fox, uh, not foxtail, but our uh, asparagus uh, that has some of the variegation, so the lighter color, not a disease. Uh, here's even palms that have yellow stripes uh, again, variegation, not a disease, just a mutation. And even some of our clivias that may have, uh, and bromelias that may have some variegation or some off color. So make sure that you are, uh, uh, be careful and not confuse diseases with something that is going to be natural. And so with that, I will post this and uh, I will also have some photographs uh, of the diseases. So from now on, we are going to not require for you to submit the samples. I will provide you with the samples so that you can study them, become familiar with them. Uh, and uh, when it's necessary, you will know what people are gonna be talking about. So we're gonna forego you looking for the samples because I understand none of, not all of you are able to go out or wanna go out. Uh, so I will provide you with that information. Just study them, become familiar with them. Take care, have a good weekend, bye-bye.